everyone, and welcome to Onyx PathCon 2021. Uh, this is our Mage the Ascension 20th Anniversary Edition uh, discussion panel. Um, my name is Travis Legg. Uh, I've worked on a Mage book or two. Um, and I am joined by uh, these lovely folks uh, around me. So in an arbitrary fashion that uh, is... Uh, the easiest thing for me to clock. Let's go ahead and uh, do our introductions, starting with uh, Hiromi, if you don't mind. Please tell sure. us uh, who you are, what you do. I almost said who you're playing, because there aren't too many actual plays. Uh, <laughs> your, <laughs> your pronouns, and a bit about your uh, connection with Mage the Ascension. Hi, uh, I'm Hiro Mikoda, uh, they, them. Uh, I am a developer and writer uh, with Onyx Path. Uh, I've been working on Mage for the past six years. Uh, everything that's been announced, uh, with the exception of uh, Book of the Fallen and the Jump Starts, I have done something for. Um, I got started because I talked to Seder and I'm like, hey, how do I get into this industry? Give, give me pointers. And he's like, right write more let, let let me see let me see your style o okay here are words i have gotten them from the word mines for you but what why do you need those have a contract oh shit okay <laughs> we're we're starting now excellent good <laughs> <laughs> beautiful and uh next up we have uh it's uh jiba correct am i pronouncing that correctly it's uh jiba jiba, jiba. Thank yeah. you, and please forgive me. Uh, no, means. That's, uh, that's quite all right. That's quite all right. Um, I'm Jibba Anderson. I am relatively new to the Onyx Path family. Um, definitely new to writing for Mage. Uh, this is what my fifth title that I've been um, asked to write in the uh, Onyx Path family. Uh, I've written for Vampire the Masquerade for the Chicago by Night Volume 5 edition. I've uh, written for Wraith. Uh, I've also uh, written for, um, they came from Classified and Tales of Depravity. And uh, so now I'm here working on Mage. Um, outside of Onyx Path, I'm in the comic book industry. I'm a writer, illustrator, and designer uh, and owner of the company Grio Enterprises, creator of its flagship title, The Horseman, and also curator of the four pages, 16 bars of visual mixtape anthology series, which currently has a Kickstarter. Uh, but thank you so much for having me be a part of the Onyx Path crew. Happy thank to you be so here. much for being here. That's super cool. Um, and last, but most certainly not least, uh, Ian A. A. Watson, please give us all of your pertinent inf information and details. I'm Ian A. A. Watson, uh, he, him. My mage history goes back about 20 years. Uh, my first credit in the RPG industry was in the Gaiju Traditions because uh, the developer at the time, Jess Hainig, uh, consulted me on uh, a few things that were going in there. I didn't know I would end up in the book, but I did. Um, then shortly after Onyx Path got started, uh, when we did the revised convention books, um, uh, Ryan Macklin, who was developing those, um, he brought me on board for the latter three of them just to do like a, a quick check on all the mechanics to make sure all the numbers added up correctly. And um, then I was sort of brought in as a, a last minute developer on a Victorian Mage um, because it's a project that I outlined back in 2006 and that outline didn't make it all the way to the final product, but um, they needed someone who knew Mage lore and that was me. So I, I took on co-development duties with Chris Allen. Awesome. Um... And yeah, uh, I'm Travis, I'm he, him, and uh, done a bit on uh, Technocracy Reloaded, Operatives Dossier, uh, all the 
sort of ballooning projects that came out from that. Uh, got to work on <laughs> um, Victorian Mage a little bit. I got to develop the jump start for that, which was super fun. That's very cool. Um, I was able to hop on to that project at a, at a very interesting and fun time. Um, so that's my that's my mage pedigree. Uh, so I assume our audience will wind up having some questions throughout the course of this panel. Uh, if you do, please type question in all caps at the front of it so that uh, one of our panelists will see it in the chat. Uh, if you have some uh, chips of onyx and you want to highlight your message, there's a little button you can push in the chat that will let you do that. It makes it a little easier for us to see what's happening with it. Uh, so what, I guess, the biggest item that's uh, on the docket, or biggest items on the docket for Mage 20th Anniversary Edition this year, would be fair to say are probably the Technocracy Reloaded and Victorian Mage. Is that, that fair to say? Um, I'd like to, if you don't have any objection, uh, start off talking a little bit with Victorian. Um, because the... A, the setting is a bit different from what's come in, in earlier iterations of the World of Darkness. Uh, and B, um, our approach to bring it to the, to the audience was a little different. Uh, so I was wondering if maybe you might enlighten us a little bit uh, about that, about those topics, Ian. Um, Victorian Mage, well, I mean, the, the genesis of that is, is pretty straightforward. You, you, you take a little bit of this and, and you take a little bit of this and, and you sort of <laughs> shove them together a little bit. Yeah. Um, if, if you're familiar with Dark Ages Mage or uh, Mage the Sorcerer's Crusade, those are sort of rather different takes on, on modern Mage the Ascension. Uh, Dark Ages Mage doesn't even use spheres, it uses foundations and pillars, and it's all very different. Um, so this is sort of another step on that journey towards what modern mage looks like, where it's, it's not quite the, the, the modern system uh, that, that mages use, but you, know, you can tell it's getting there. Um, but one thing we really wanted to focus on was uh, sort of the themes of uh, imperialism and colonialism and how they're pretty shitty things to do and uh, it's it's tempting to just say like okay you know tradition's good technocracy bad the technocracy were the ones engaging in all this and the traditions are the good guys but as with most things it's just it's not that straightforward um, sometimes the order of reason sorry uh, the, the order of Hermes uh, the celestial chorus a lot of them are uh, structured Western traditions. Some of them are engaging in that sort of shit. Um, and uh, some of the uh, more liberal leading uh, conventions, uh, like what becomes the Sons of Ether, uh, they were objecting to a lot of it. So, um, and of course, you have all the, the disparate crafts around the world who are usually the victims of all of this sort of thing. So there, there's a lot of interesting interplay uh, in in sort of in the same sense that uh, Mage the Sorcerer's Crusade, it built itself as um, a conflict between magic, faith, and science. This is sort of taking uh, a similar approach, but it's a little bit more nuanced in how it does it. I have uh, and a great admiration for tackling the uh, difficult topics that that that, that brings up um and i know uh I, I, obviously there was a, a rather diverse group of authors hired to work on that book um but were there and and maybe this was all laid in before you came aboard because i know you said you, you j jumped on relatively late in the game um but a, apart from just giving the floor to uh, a, a wide array of voices, uh, what sort of um, guideposts were you using to sort of navigate the issues that, that brought up? A lot, of, a lot of that work was done before I came on board. Um, there was a lot of jumbling for a lot of reasons. I'm not saying like, hey, some developer was crap, so they got rid of them. Right. Um, it, sometimes it happens in development where people have to come and go for 
for reasons. Right. All um, sorts of them. Yeah. Yes. Um, so it was, it just ha- so happened that fairly late in the game, um, Chris Allen jumped on as sort of the, the main developer in organizing the troops. And Chris didn't know Mage that well, so the, he needed a counterpart to help him who was more familiar with Mage. Um, so a, a lot of the, the heavy lifting in terms of the contracting and the actual writing of the book had already been done when I came on board. So um, Chris, or perhaps one of the, even the earlier developers, would probably be a better person to ask in um, how the writing was approached, because that was already done when I came on board. Sweet. And Hiromi, uh, you worked on Victorian, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, uh, it had a very long development cycle uh, because, like, life happens, and sometimes someone needs to drop off of a book, and sometimes the dice are all ones, and several people have to drop off of a book, and that's kind of what happened to Victorian Mage. Um, but in terms of like uh, establishing the idea that we needed to make Victorian Mage more representative of the entire globe as opposed to like a quarter of it uh was established pretty early on uh i remember having a um a video conference with Seder like how it had to have been like three years ago uh there were there were a bunch of folks uh on on the call and some of them also ended up it, it never mind it doesn't I don't need to talk about personnel changes because if you have a development cycle that long, it's inevitable. Um, but yeah, like we we kind of set out uh, from the beginning to be like, okay, well, a lot of material that we have about Mage is very uh, Western centric. So let's let's recognize that the rest of the world exists and find out what's been happening. Uh, and well, and that's been a uh sort of the state of mage since its inception right um for right wrong and different you know better or worse it's always been approached from a very uh western first mentality until relatively recently uh and i think it's probably a fair assessment to say that uh everything that's currently being worked on uh for 20th anniversary edition is kind of taking that uh, the sim- a similar approach to what uh, Victorian did in the sense of trying to broaden those out and, and reconcile uh, some of those uh, previous iterations, you know, baggage, for lack of a better word, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so far, like, so good. It's especially... Go ahead. Sorry. It's especially tempting with a book that has Victorian in the title um, to, you know, <laughs> focus on Victorian England because that's what everyone's going to think about. Uh, and uh, the order of reason becomes the technocratic union um, at the, the great exhibition of the works of old races or whatever it was in, in the Crystal Palace in Hyde Park in London. Like, uh, just conceptually, the whole thing is, is very England-centric. And I know it was important when I wrote my original outline way back when, uh, and to the crew who's putting together this version of the book, uh, that you know we can't just limit it to that. It can't just be Victorian England. It has to be like there are groups of mages from all over the world, and, and this has to be representative of that. Sweet. Yeah, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong. And uh, I usually have to get it. I usually have to utter a name seven times before I'm sure it's right. Uh, Jaiba, right? Jaiba. Jibba. 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 Thank Shorter. You. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> um, I'll carve it into my uh, hand later so that I never mess it up again. Um, so, Jibba, you did not have any work on um, Victorian, correct? No. Now, have you no. have you had a chance to engage the material just from like the the uh, fan side, or well, as reference for other material? Well, um, so you know, I've been I've been called on to um, retool. Uh, the African-based sex <laughs> of, of mage. And what's interesting um, for this project, and it's kind of like the same um, for all of the OPP projects, 
is that I come in, I come in as someone who used to game very, very long ago. <laughs> okay. Um, but, you know, I'm called into these things and I'm really called into sort of world build and world build from a different mentality, right? Um, as Ian stated before, you know, uh, the, with, with the Victorian age and what I had seen and what I read through Mage, you know, was, um, yeah, it did come from a very Eurocentric lens, you know? And so when I'm coming into doing these pieces, um, what's the, the interesting part of having someone like me coming in doing these pieces is that I come from a bicultural background what I mean by that is uh, my mother is from West Africa. My father is from the States. So um, I'm coming with this pan-African viewpoint on one hand, I'm a first generation, you know, child of an immigrant. <laughs> you, you, you see what I'm saying? Um, also in terms of my comic book work outside of uh, the OPP stuff, you know, it does focus a lot on um, identity, this, you know, my, again, this bicultural African, African American identity. And the opportunities that I have um, in dealing with the, uh, you know, in dealing with um, the, these universe, you know what I mean, especially the world of darkness, is that I have an opportunity, you know, and I see what's going on before, and it's like, okay, I have an opportunity to be like, okay, let me put some flavor and let me put some education in here and let me put some different viewpoints in here. Um, above and beyond just being quote unquote an African American voice, right? Uh, it's to be a unique African American voice because I'm uniquely an African American. And also in terms of like my viewpoint and when I research um, stuff from my own work in terms of the continent, in terms of the faith systems, in terms of um, the, the traditions, you know, um, how these traditions have migrated from, uh, you know, how they have migrated because of the transatlantic slave trade and how they have uh, also transformed and transmogrified. Um, I'm able to put those things into uh, the universe, right? So for example, when we talk about mage, you know, we're talking about magic. And as opposed to thinking about what the game defines as magic, I begin to think about, well, what do I define as magic? Like what is magical? You know what I mean? Um, so for example, you know, the Ngoma, uh, the Ngoma are, in my opinion, those are like the pure African mages, right? And then the Bata are the African mages because of the transatlantic slave trade. So with those two, I can separate them because I looked at the Ngoma and even before I'm, you know, reading up on the Ngoma, I'm thinking, oh, they're the griots. They're the storytellers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just because for me, it just makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, like they are, that is the tradition, the tradition of language, the tradition of storytelling, the variety of storytelling. Um, you know, and, and that's even before I read like the bio on the Angoma. And then when I read the bio on the, I'm like, oh, okay, all right, cool. Yeah, you, you guys are, you guys are in line of what I'm about to do. <laughs> set, set up set up for you yeah 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 like like what i'm about to do with these two groups <laughs> you know um i i saw that like okay you guys will be able to accept how i how i approach um each group and how i infuse each group with the history of those situations, you know what I mean? With the history of the transatlantic slave trade, along with the history of, you know, colonialism and whatnot. And um, being able to approach that with, it's interesting, approach that with a clear 
lens, but also apply it to a fantastic situation. Right. So, yeah. Well, and that, one of the things that's uh, extremely interesting, but also incredibly challenging from my perspective about the world of darkness is working in a, in a world that all of the elements you're meant to recognize, right? The, the, you're meant to recognize the person on the streets experience in the world of darkness for the most part. Uh, mm -hmm. And then just, you know, turn up the contrast, dark in the shadows mm -hmm. um, is kind of the, the premise, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, through nearly three decades of development at this point, a whole lot of, uh, you know, fanciful fairy tale things that got made up by somebody somewhere uh, have been integrated into that. Uh, not always with uh, who that may or may not impact in mind in the process of, of that integration. Um, or operating from a, a perspective of like misconception about who that may or may not impact, right? Um, so the the challenge and the labor of of getting that un, you know ironed out in a way that is both uh, as consistent as it needs to be with the previous World of Darkness, you know there I know that I have literally said to people I was on books I've been developing like you know canon is the thing you fire a player out of when they're a pain in the neck at your table it has nothing you know, it doesn't matter to this book um you know you do it fix what is broken um you know uh, but but i guess can, can you speak to and also uh, if you don't mind hiromi a little bit speak to as well just kind of the experience of of rank of that wrestle because that does not sound easy um so so here's the thing. It's like, yeah, on one hand, you know, definitely have to respect the lore that's already been established um, with the world of darkness. You know, uh, I would imagine <laughs> that it would be the same as if I were writing for DC or Marvel, you know, that sort of thing. If I was working on one of their characters, I'm like, okay, as a writer, I'm like, all right, I'm going to have to respect what has come before. I'm going to have to respect the lore of it. Um, with that being said, if there are holes, <laughs> you, you know what I mean, that need to be plugged, I'm going to plug them. Um, in addition to that, I also look at my role as being someone to enhance that world. So, for example, when I was uh, working on Vampire Chicago by Night, you know, I, I was familiar with vampire, you know, the whole history of it. I was like, oh, wow, I'm writing vampire, that right. sort of thing. And I'm going into um, writing that game. And I just kind of had some common thoughts. I was like, you know, with the whole world of vampire, I'm like, OK, you got a hole, but, you know, it's it's industrial. You know, you've got the leather, you've got the goth stuff. I'm like, what about house music? You know what I mean? I was like thinking about I was thinking about black vampires. I'm like, yo, I was like, where's the house music in in vampire? You know what I mean? Furthermore, I'm like, where are the drag houses in in, 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 in vampire? Because that's when Pose just came out, and I was enamored with it, and I was like, hmm, you know, how cool would it be to have? vampire drag houses named after vampires from movies and i'm not talking like you know nosferatu or anything like that i'm talking about what if there was a house named after the movie vamp what was there what if there was a house named after a character in the movie near dark you know or from dust till dawn you know or my favorite and i'm so glad it went through the house of mamu walde you know like named after black killer you, you know <laughs> <laughs> and and that sort of thing and again using vampire as that metaphor you, you you know what i mean and and it was a conscious decision for me to um respect the lgbtq uh community like that um what was interesting about vampires like at the time what i was doing is that some of the characters i were creating you know, I was actually honoring some of my family members, um, you know, so, some of my LGBTQ family members. Uh, the character I created, Francois Mama Walde, 
um, in my mind, her voice was the voice of my dear departed uncle Ron. Um, physically, she uh, represents my, I imagine my cousin, <laughs> you know, my cousin who is, you know, she's, she's a femme, she's a femme, uh, she's a femme lesbian model, you know, plus size lesbian model, you know? And I was like, yeah, that's visually, that's who Francois is. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's who they are. And um, ultimately with that stuff, the grounding for me is telling that personal story, telling that real story. Like even if that story isn't necessarily my own, just, just being honest and authentic about it. And especially when it comes to representing, you know, the various aspects of um, African and African American culture, the diasporatic culture of it is that, you know, as much as I am talking about, and as much as, you know, yes, I am a black person, you know, but I am one black person with one unique frame of mind. In order for me to be authentic about that depiction, you know, that depiction of my culture, I'm going to draw from other aspects. I'm going to draw from viewpoints that I'm not familiar with. You know what I mean? It's like, like I said, you know, Mom was, mom is Liberian, dad's from America. I was born and raised in Detroit. I live in Chicago. I don't necessarily know what it's like to be a cat from Georgia. You know what I'm saying? I don't know necessarily what it's like to be um, someone who's Nigerian, you know, or even um, Jamaican, that sort of thing. So what I do is like, I, you know, I research, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I read up on the history of those areas, you know, bring it all together, try to fit it within the narrative. And then in terms of finding the story, finding the hook of how to explain this. So for example, with the Bata that I just finished, um, the way that I approached writing about the Bata was like, okay, I'm gonna do a podcast. And I'm, a, and I'm going to explain Bata culture as a podcast in a mixtape. And I'm going to, and bringing my bringing my experience as a dj as one who does a uh you know mixtape podcast it's like i'm going into that mode and i'm going to grab these songs right and these songs are going to explain what you know what the bata culture is what the book of moses the seven books of moses is so again bringing in something new from you know reading on all the not just voodoo and santeria but also hoodoo and candomblé and you know what i mean and 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 all these other things in order to make it make sense because that's what the bata represents you know and I'm going to be doing the same <laughs> you know just try to find my hook for the ngoma so i can like kick that out and explain that culture that makes sense yeah that's yeah awesome that's super cool what about what about you here what do you What's your what's your take on this? Um. So what? I was one of the authors uh, that that Travis used the uh, canon something that we fire bad players out of uh, towards because uh, um, for lore of the traditions um, I was working on the Kashiana and like it, generally speaking, if I'm working on mage, uh, I'm. I'm working on making it uh, more Asian and more queer because those those are the voices that I can represent best, and generally those voices are needed, so that's what I do. Um, and I, it's hard to not just go, to just cut everything out that doesn't make sense to me, um, because like. I would have to like just reinvent everything, which doesn't, it, it's going to cause like this sort of uh, instantaneous addition clash. Uh, and like, I I grew up with first ed D&D. &D. I, I know exactly what Grognard discussions go to. So I'm just, I'm not, I'm not trying to create an environment where that has to happen. Uh, but at the same time, if, I see a Chinese nationalist organization uh, like the Wulong and 
everything that they're doing is uh, very like everything that they're doing and saying seems to be taken from like uh, a more uh, Hong Kong or even Taiwan uh, perspective. I'm like, well, if they're Chinese nationalists, they're not doing that. They're it's it's Mandarin, hundred uh, percent. And like this, these are like small little mistakes that like people um, who aren't familiar with the cultures involved uh, in East Asia aren't just they're just not going to pick up on. Um, and so, what I can do is go, okay, that doesn't make sense. I am going to take it and change it slightly, and then I'll explain it up here that. I'm just fixing the transliterations and updating them because it's been like 20 years. Uh, and what I'm actually doing is I'm narrowing the cultural focus so that it can be accurate within the description uh, that exists. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I'm querying the shit out of it um, <laughs> as well as making it uh, uh, more gender inclusive because uh, with uh, the Akashiana, uh, the the first name, or at least one of the first names, was the Akashic Brotherhood, and then they were using uh, the Cantonese uh, terms uh, for uh, uh, Kung Fu um, lineage, uh, like Xi Dai and Xi uh, Hing. But like, not only are there those uh, Cantonese terms specifically, they're gendered. <laughs> like, Xi Hing doesn't mean my senior it means my senior brother and i'm like well this this faction is all about reincarnation and canonically from the very beginning people have been reincarnating into uh different gendered uh spaces so like as soon as people start reincarnating it's no longer just a brotherhood and like you can fully commit to like making it masculine but why would you when it's it's immediately going to stop being just a uh, masculine dominated uh, space because of that i'm gonna get hate mail for this and i'm gonna fucking enjoy it <laughs> because people are in the akashiana and also uh the shakravanti but i didn't write the, them so i can't put my gay hands on that because people are reincarnating into bodies that don't necessarily match what their avatar is telling them their history was like and what their experiences used to be like there is a higher than average percentage of trans people and non-binary people within the akashiana because that just fucking makes sense right of like, course there would be you look at the lore <laughs> and you go right <laughs> why aren't these people trans as fuck they should be well and <laughs> if, if you don't mind a brief interjection here, um, one thing that I try to uh, keep in mind with some things like this, and, and one thing that, if you don't mind me saying, I think you handled beautifully in the section uh, that you wrote about the Kashiana in that's in lore, um, is that some of this stuff, like I do not think that you know a group of uh, our, our beloved white folks in the '90s that were making these books originally. Uh, I don't think any of this was approached with, with uh, malice or with a, with a bad intent. I think the issue is is you have a bunch of people you, you had a, a bunch of creators who did not have the tools and the language that we have today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now we do, uh, and my, my mindset from a developer's perspective is since we have those tools and language today, we just should apply them and it shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't be this should not cause um, you know, uh, addition wars to pop off and people to be like, oh, you're, you know, you're SJWing up my game. No, actually, we're just talking about the same stuff we've been talking about, except we have better tools to understand it. We're like scientists. See, it all comes back to the technocracy. We're like scientists. We found out that the previous theory was inaccurate and we're updating our data. That's it. <laughs> you know? If if that's a fair interjection to make, and I apologize. No, that's, that, that's totally fair. And it's important uh, to realize. I'm like, um, Back back in the '90s, like they they were trying. They they had an Asian faction. They they had an Indian faction, and like they, that the two had like this weird, uh, complicated um, 
not exactly a religious, but not not religious war. Uh, just sort of like highlights and like brings up like, hey, we we have uh, Asian factions, we we have uh, African factions. Like they they tried. Uh, they didn't have like the cultural resources in order to make them accurate. Uh, but like the, I, I a hundred percent believe that there's like no malice that they're not, they're not trying to do a bad job. It's just that the tools that they had at the time didn't allow them to do it at the level that they wanted to. Right. That was, that's one of the things that I wanted to, um, bring up and I noticed as well, like when I first, you know, got on to writing the Bata and Nagoma, you know, I looked at the names and I'm like, okay, they're both named after drums. And if I had my, and if I had my druthers, I would go into my files and I would find proper African terms to call them and things like that, especially with Nagoma. And then it was like, oh, they're called the Griots. And, but I thought about it and I was like, you know what? I can let that go because I know that's lore based. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and I know and I know that and I know that they tried and it's not offensive to me, you know what I mean? It was just like slightly irksome, you, you know, in terms of a naming thing, but I was like but there again that whole situation of as you said Romy, um there the heart was in the right place, right? Yeah. And the seeds were planted. You know, like there was that awareness there. And then <clears throat> as reading their descriptions, I'm like, okay, you know, it's not so much, you know, again, Hiromi, as, as you were mentioning um, with the group and, you know, and being, again, those, spe those uh, specificities, right? Of, uh, you know, then they would only speak Mandarin. And if it was like this, so on and so forth. Um, I get into those like bits of specificity as well, but I look at, specific uh, specificity as a launch point to get really creative you know because it i see it as an opportunity to expose the audience to different modes of thinking and then furthermore different modes of storytelling that they didn't even think about before you know and and part of it you know some of these some of these cats that get upset and, you know, rah, 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 SJW, it's like SJW these. It's like you didn't know shit before. So sit back and get educated. On top of that, sit back, get educated, and you're about to enter into a whole new world of storytelling that you didn't even know before. And that's going to enhance your game exponentially. So you need to, you need to absorb all this. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Get over yourselves, roll them dice, play this game, and it's going to be an enjoyable experience. Well, and because it has more, you know what I mean? Right. It has more to it. Absolutely. And also, I mean, I would like to interject for anybody who might be watching this and might be kind of dubious of the idea that um, previous knowledge about the factions of Mage, particularly the non-technocratic factions of Mage, might somehow be erroneous. Uh, the Order of Hermes did a whole lot. It's well documented over 30 years of lore. They did a whole lot of shoving round pegs into square holes. Like, you're all dream speakers. <laughs> you know, we, that's been in the lore since day one. So none of the, so this stuff, you know, oh, welcome these ch these new elements to your table with open arms because, you know, if you really need to find a way to justify it in the lore that, that precedes it, um, the Order of Hermes gave you bad da data. So ultimately, in a, in, in a roundabout way, it's all Tremere's fault. Mm. I mean, you're not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I don't want to, just to check, because I literally do not have the chat open in front of me, unfortunately. Uh, do we have any questions that we're just blowing right past while we're sitting here talking? Uh, uh, yes, a while back. Uh, sorry, just going back to the Again, school. my apologies. I am nursing a very ill computer right now, so I can't stream while I'm monitoring chat. I apologize to you and the audience. So uh, Flames Rising asks, what type of uh, what type of mage character is each of your favorites? Hmm. Uh, I'm happy to take this question last. So uh... OK, uh, I'll go first. Uh, mine would be, um, well, I've, I've always loved the Victorian version of um, uh, the various mage factions. 
and being able to work on them was a huge treat. Uh, so, I don't know, um, let's say the Voltarian Order, because that's that's right when the, the, the convention that eventually became the core of the Sons of Aether just w was founded right at the beginning of the, uh, the 19th century there. So that's neat. Anyway, I'm, you know what? Honestly, I'm the new guy. <laughs> so, hey, you know, so in terms of like, what's my favorite mage order? Honestly, the, my favorite mage order is the stuff that I'm writing right now. <laughs> you know, um, I just, with the box, I just got done with that. And they seem, you know, they're cool. I look at them, you know, they're definitely, um, they are the revolutionaries of the mage universe, right? Uh, they are... You know they've been through it right they've been through they've been through oppression on multiple levels and they're still here and they're and they're growing and they're thriving and they're getting it ready uh with the angoma uh i think it's going to be with the angoma are they're going to be fun too because that is going to give me the opportunity to play with um uh, african uh, aristocracy and also play a little bit into um, some aspects of African arrogance, if you will. So that's so that's going to be fun to truly establish their order and kind of make them, you know, a little sedity. You know, like they they they're gonna be, you know, some of them gonna be some assholes. You know, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to um, actually unfold that some of them, you know, because of the whole notion of tradition and whatnot that they they uh, contributed to some things getting fucked up, <laughs> you know? Uh, so that's going to be fun to like really flesh out. I like, I like mage games where um, I'm investigating something, trying to sort of uh, peek behind the, the veil and uh, learn what's going on. So that usually ends up being like iteration X or um, uh, void engineers, just because like they're, they're not necessarily good people, but they're very curious uh, and playing with how, uh, with the morality there often leads to like interesting in character questions like, well, we can find the answer right now. We we can just zap him in the head and take the take all the knowledge just right out. But that's horribly immoral. So should we do it? We really need this information. Uh, and like, I I enjoy uh, exploring uh, that question. And like, folks in the chat are going like technocracy heroes or villains someone responded uh yes which is the correct answer they yeah, that's the correct answer, <laughs> they, so. they are both uh they they would very much like to be uh heroes and uh individual technocrats could succeed at that the technocracy as a whole can't but they also they're not villains in the sense that they are uh, mustache twirling uh, evildoers tying uh, people to train tracks, but like... Unless you're talking about the syndicate, in which case. I mean... <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm 60% I'm, 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 I'm kidding. Um, continue. I mean, they are, is <laughs> they are issued uh, twirly mustaches uh, once, once they're fully integrated. So, I mean... That's fair. I, so for the longest time I played, uh, my favorite was Cult of Ecstasy, hands down. Um, and, and maybe it's a sign of my advancing age uh, or just, you know, new perspectives on the universe. But um, I can nail it down to a specific character, the uh, supervisor I played on our Technocracy Reloaded actual play um, for two reasons. One, he was... Uh, 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 black suit he was who... David Lynch <laughs> right that was reason to I... <laughs> he was a black suit who just refused to get promoted uh, out of the field basically he was like I have work to do and it's here and it's making the world better 
and he firmly believed that to the point that he gave his life for it, and two, because it gave me a chance to do a David Lynch impression for, for five weeks. And it was a wonderful experience. Thank you for asking. Um, you think about that, Tammy. <laughs> If, um. <laughs> if folks want to see that actual play, I just linked it. I uh, appreciate it. Thank uh, you. It is delightful. Uh, Agro Shim uh, asks, uh, if you could remove one thing from Mage Cannon, what would it be? Uh, I answered them in the chat, but because the chat doesn't necessarily go along with the video and we're talking about it now, uh, I actually got to do that already. <laughs> uh, so the five elemental dragons, not to be confused with the exalted five elemental dragons, um, also known as the Daolo Laoshi, um, were originally written from a very Western perspective with the idea being that uh, Asia is full of mages. Sure, that's, that's a, reasonable assumption, a reasonable assumption. And tons of them are techn technocrats. Okay, yeah, I mean, China did kind of invent technocracy. So sure, that, that's reasonable. And these mages are hiding within the technocracy. China. Fucking what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's there's three of us for every one of you. We're hiding in you. K. <laughs> yeah, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make a whole lot of sense when you start looking at, you know, basic math. Uh, and um, some of the faction names just did not make a whole lot of sense um, once you understood uh, much about the culture at all. Uh, and so... Uh, for Technocracy Reloaded, I provided a sidebar which retcons just all of that mess uh, into something uh, that is more informed from an Asian perspective. So if if you would like to um, retcon uh, the Daolo uh, Laoshi, then go for it. I heavily encourage it because I do not like what came before it, and that's why I got rid of it. <laughs> Good. Uh, Actually, for my part, oh, it's it. Sorry, um, it was. <clears throat> if if you're talking removing from canon in that, uh, like sort of erasing it from existence, pretending it had never happened, uh, it's it's already sort of been like relegated to the dustbins of history, where it's just quietly never been mentioned before. There was a faction called the Wu Kang, who were the Wu Tang. Excuse me. No, the Wu Kang. I, know I wish. And oh, way, just, less cool. <laughs> way less cool. Just seeing Hiromi's uh, reaction there. Listen, um, listen, Meth, if you're watching, call us. We, we'll, we'll make a Wu-Tang faction. We'll make it happen. 100%. The Wu-Tang were pretty racist and pretty transphobic, and <clears throat> they're gone now. They haven't been mentioned at all, I think, since revised edition. And, um, yeah, if, if at all possible, I would just sort of like tear those pages out of those previous books. Like it was just, it's it's not a good faction to include. Uh, so yeah, they, they just quietly have not been included in any project since then. And it's it's all for the better. Um, again, being the newbie uh, in terms of taking out, um, I don't know, but uh, I would say I actually am enjoying adding things in. I'm, I'm enjoying I'm enjoying the fact that I do have a canvas with these two groups to actually flesh them out more and actually give them a hierarchy and a reason, you know, and um, and dealing again with, uh, you know, the different mythologies and whatnot and playing with that and tying it in with music and, or excuse me, tying it in with, um, uh, with Mage. I say music because music is magical. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and, and then, you know, and, and getting those divisions and, de and developing that history, um, I'm having fun with that. So if at the end, when you read this stuff and somebody gets mad and like, I can't believe he added this in, well then, you know, I'd leave. at least I put something in here that somebody can get upset about to say, they need to take it out with the next volume, so. <laughs> I have a follow-up for that, but I'm going to wait until after Travis. <laughs> so, uh, well, and much like Hiromi, I kind of already did, but only to a small extent. Like, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd completely jettison the Ascension War, um, but I would make it a much less 
a central conflict to mage um, because I think because to me the premise of mage is we're all enlightened and we all know what's best for humanity right we just happen to disagree on what that is mm -hmm. um, and to me that conflict on an interpersonal level is a lot more interesting when you get away from the idea that and I just dislike you because you know we use different tools when it's more like no I dislike you because I dislike what you stand for like on a fundamental level you know what I mean and I think the ascension war uh, as it's worked so far uh, has been lovely shorthand but often too short of a shorthand uh, so I've done everything I can in the books that I've developed to uh, find ways to skirt around it or at least to like elevate the conflict to uh, to baggage you're bringing with you to an interpersonal battle rather than we have to go beat those people up because they're technocrats and or traditionalists and or members of the DA. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. Uh, it'll make a lot more sense when you read the books, I promise. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that would be, if I could wave a magic wand, that would be how I would tackle it. Uh, the how dare they put them, uh, put, put this into the book uh, made me immediately think of uh, one of the wonders I made for uh, Rich Bastard's Guide to Magic, which it is going to be a wonderful book. It is going to be a book that is just like profane <laughs> because it's it's rich people being terrible. Uh, oh, real life. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. And one of the thing, one of the wonders I made, uh, and something uh, that I'm kind of proud of for how it interacts with Mage Canon. Uh, is a sculpture made by a mysterious magical uh, sculptor uh, called the finger, <laughs> which is a chunk of uh, mistridge carved into a middle finger. <laughs> and if you if you are a tradition mage and you're near it, it just makes you mad. It just makes you real fucking mad. You don't even have to know why. It just makes you mad. <laughs> Funny. I love that. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Do we have any other questions hiding in the chat? Otherwise, we have... I'm sure there's a couple other things we could... We haven't even gotten into, like, Reloaded much or anything like that. Can I nerd out about a thing? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things, I mean, since I was brought on as the, the resident mage expert, uh, one of the things I, I, um, I don't know if we're going to be getting something akin to Beckett's Jihad Diary. Uh, we're doing apocalyptic record for werewolves, so there's a possibility, but I wanted to sort of put, put a few little Easter eggs in to, to reward longtime mage fans. Um, one thing is um, uh, in the original... As Mage was originally being conceived, the Sons of Ether were going to be called the Parmenidians. And a bit of that ended up in the first uh, Sons of Ether tradition book, where uh, it says one of their previous names, like back in, like before the 1800s, was the Pupils of Parmenides. Um, and it listed that they had even been like a faction of the Celestial Chorus, which is just, okay. Um, and that was like the only time that has ever been mentioned. But if you look at sort of the Sons of Ether on a long timeline, starting off with House Golo all the way to the modern Sons of Ether, they spent more time as the pupils of Parmenides than anything else. So I put a little mention of that in Victorian Mage because it's, it's a weird, cool little thing that was mentioned once and I wanted to bring it up again. And, and I did that with a few different things, just sprinkled a few little mentions in there uh, for long-time World of Darkness fans, long-time Mage fans, um, just, you know, I wanted to reward you for, for paying attention and for being with us for almost 30 years now. Well, and allow me to thank you in front of the internet and everybody for lobbing a few of those uh, tidbits my way when I was working on uh, Dossier, um, because as we were talking about some of the uh, factions that were in there, there were a couple of technocratic factions that had gotten like one mention or two mentions throughout all of uh, Mage history, and you were like, "You should do something with this and that." And I was, 
Like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> 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 but so thank you for um, anytime it looks like uh, I or the writers on Dossier dug into some real obscure deep lore and threw something cool out. It's thanks to Ian putting it in our lap. So um, thank you for that. Thank you. And you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so um, looks like we got five minutes left. If you have a last question or two, please get them in the chat. Uh, otherwise I do want to mention just because we've, uh, talked about how super excited i am for uh, operatives dossier i know um i know that we're kind of in the uh, i guess you know one might say final stages of getting reloaded together uh and out to the people um but uh and then shortly thereafter i would assume dossier will be hot on its heels but we had a lot of fun working on that book there's a lot of cool stuff in it and it was a place where i had a, a fun opportunity to kind of put my permanent fingerprint on how I think the digital web ought to work um, that I'm sure will be outdated and, and silly in 10 years. People look back at it and be like, you know, that's not how computers work, right? Um, but, you know, I, I would like to stand on Mike Pondsmith's shoulders and on the shoulders of FASA and also make grossly inaccurate, uh, you know, speculative fiction about the internet. <laughs> so I, I'm thrilled for the opportunity to do that and I look forward to seeing what people think of it. Uh, we have a panel, according to Dixie, starting yep. right at 8 o'clock, so we're probably oh. going to have to dip out well, a couple then, hey, minutes early. We can do that. We can bounce yeah. early. So thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, make sure that you're following all of the lovely folk who have uh, shared this screen with me on their social medias. Uh, take care of yourselves and each other, and if you have not yet done so, please get your shots. It is the and, uh, mutual uh, and enlightened thing to do. It is. Also down in the chat, uh, I uh, relinked uh, Jibba's Kickstarter. Uh, I, I would link to the Essence Kickstarter, but the bot will do it in like five seconds. So, sure. you know. Word. All right, cool. Well, uh, see you all later. Thank all right. you all. Thanks so much. Have a good weekend.